Any free society should be based on the concept of voluntary action, but voluntary action alone does not lead to a free society. Voluntarism has been popularized by the concept that you own yourself. If you own yourself, then you should be able to sell your time, body, and hence, your liberty. The problem with this argument is that you don't own yourself, you are yourself. To say that you own something implies that there is an owner and the thing that is owned. You can't sell your labor because you are your labor. Otherwise, people would go back to sleep when their alarm clock goes off while their labor goes off to work. While the argument of self-ownership sounds interesting and even implies the concept of liberty, the reality is the opposite. The very idea of self-ownership turns people into commodities. It strips the humanity out of humans. People can now be bought and sold in the marketplace. On a larger scale, the commodification of human beings has stripped the humanity out of society, leaving a landscape devoid of human qualities and a people completely alienated from each other, a society in which we exist in invisible cages. The commodification and exploitation of people has always existed, but it was capitalized by Frederick Taylor and his theory of scientific management. In the late 1800s, Taylor complained that workers were lazy and can produce exponentially more by tough management. He studied the motions of workers to find out how to increase their productivity. It turns out that if an employee performed the same task over and over, then he could manufacture more product. Anyone who refused to conform to Taylor's methods were fired and had their wages reduced. Soon, a new class of managers emerged, while the highly experienced labor force was transformed into unskilled workers. It was Taylor's belief that all would be benefited by his methodology. To his surprise, with the increase of productivity and profits, the workers' wages were stagnant and even decreased. Scientific management, along with a new class of managers, quickly spread to all sectors of the economy. All of society, the schools, the workplace, the government, could be turned into large assembly lines. The fast food industry today epitomizes Taylor's legacy. Behind the counter, kitchens are geared so the worker doesn't have to move or even think. Each person performs the same repetitive task endlessly like robots. The factory of yesterday has been transformed into the high rise in the cubicle. The factory foreman has been replaced by the suit and tie. Almost every job, including office work, has been reduced to monotonous tasks, typing, printing, going to meetings, and generating reports that nobody reads. It's all the same every day, these dungeons dressed in fluorescent lights, phony smiles, and mundane tasks. We were told that if we went to college, we would be marine biologists, psychologists, and writers. With the exception of a few, nothing could be further from the truth. The average student debt today is over $23,000. All those wannabe artists, sociologists, and investigative journalists have been prepped for the reality of the cubicle, not for their choosing, because they must pay back their loans. These people will be herded into sterile offices like animals because the world doesn't want truly creative people. The private sector needs people who can write memos, push papers, and calculate profits and losses. The managers will impose work tempos, production quotas, you punch in, you punch out, surf the internet, you'll stay late, you'll daydream about what life could have been because this isn't living, this is dying. While the government is usually blamed for limiting individual freedom, nothing attacks human liberty and sovereignty more than the workplace. A person can buy you and extract your labor. An entire system of ultra-surveillance ensures obedience to your superiors. Regulations are all prevailing. You are told when to show up to work, when you can leave, and what you must do in the meantime. They watch over you, inspect you, spy on you. They punish, forbid, correct, assess, number, and abuse. You are told what to wear, you are trained how to talk, and you are forced to compete with other workers. When you talk back or make a mistake, you can be disciplined or scolded as if you were an infant. To paraphrase Bob Black, discipline is what the factory and the office and the store share with the prison and the school and the mental hospital. It is something historically original and horrible. It was beyond the capacities of demonic dictators such as Nero, Genghis Khan, and Ivan the Terrible. For all their bad intentions, they just didn't have the machinery to control their subjects as thoroughly as modern despots do. This is the complete annihilation of human dignity, transforming people into prisoners. Even the most totalitarian states never had this much dominion over their subjects. We used to get injured on the playground. Now we get occupational overuse syndrome, musculoskeletal disorder, repetitive strain, tendonitis, cervical radiculopomy, ulnar entrapment. We have problems with our eyes and our spine that even the best doctors can't figure out. The sedentary lifestyle is the new trend, along with its legion of diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, and obesity. 
Performing the same task day after day, week after week, year after year is an assault on the human psyche. Nothing can be more detrimental to human growth, creativity, personal progress than the tedium of the workplace. When a person carries out the same monotonous job, they are naturally drained of energy at the end of each day. It is no wonder then that the average person spends over four hours a day watching television. Consider that. We spend eight hours at work, eight hours sleeping, and after preparing for work, commuting to work, and eating at home, we only have five hours to ourselves, and four of those are spent in front of the television. We actually live in a society that nurtures and maximizes stupidity and stunts human potentiality. Repetition is the enemy of every worker, the chains of humanity, yet it is the liberator of the business executive and the managers. Instead of using technology to free individuals, as it could be, the private sector has turned people into gears and into commodities, while they are the beneficiaries. These people make a living off of our lives, stripping us of our dignity, stealing our meaningfulness, and seizing our essence. Frederick Taylor's legacy has become ubiquitous. In the last 100 years, his methods have been studied, improved, and refined with immense precision. Scientific management is today's god. Its technique has saturated everything. Our schools, our workplace, the intelligentsia, the government, and even our lives are regimented with this insanity. We can see it all around us in the cars we drive, in the advertising we see, in the government that doesn't work, and in the homes we live. When something is so pervasive, we become entangled in its net. Every day is the same, a repetition with no end, dulling the person until they feel like they are living in a dark haze underwater. We were told that if we worked hard enough, we could experience the American dream. What we weren't told is that there isn't one, and there never was one. A new reality awaits our young, where wealth inequality has been celebrated and deified. Yet inequality has created the separation of power, and power, more than anything else, limits liberty. The workplace needs to be transformed, not by de-skilling labor as Taylor did. Instead, we need to liberate workers. Every employee should have the opportunity to participate in a variety of jobs from manual to intelligent labor. Workers should have equity in the workplace so they can call it their own. They should not be perceived as mere automata or commodities on a factory line, but as living beings. We should be building technology to liberate, not to enslave. All tedious and unwanted jobs should be reduced or automated. Most of all, we should be producing not for the market, but for people. It is important not to completely dismiss Taylor and his methods. Productivity is important. After all, both the U.S. and the Soviets under Lenin used Taylor's methods to pull themselves out of the Dark Ages. However, there comes a time in every society to transform such barbaric and childish techniques with moderation and compassion. That time is now. We cannot talk about liberty if we can't even mention the place that we spend a third of our life. But it's voluntary, you say. That is always the answer, repeated and repeated. It's voluntary. We live in freedom. No, we don't live in freedom. We live in invisible cages. We live in slavery. While it is true that every free society should be voluntary, voluntarism is not enough. Labor should be humanity's highest aspiration, the basis of one's dignity. Until the day comes when the thinker works and the worker thinks, free, intelligent labor can emerge and humanity can once again be instituted. Work sucks, few will argue with that. However, people are only as free as their economic situation allows. Each day we sell ourselves in the market in exchange for basic survival. For this work, this rat cage, we spend about a third of our lives enriching others, stifling our own human growth and creativity, dumbing ourselves down by micro tasks, and relinquishing our personal freedom. The repetition, humiliation, and dehumanization of our system begs the question, why? There must be a better way. I call for the transformation of the workplace. The first step is to implement a tested alternative to our system of production, worker self-management. In my next video, I'll discuss other transformations, what some call the abolition of work. Change cannot take place on a superficial level. Change must reach into the institutions that cultivate and shape who we are. We have to examine the underlying structures that ultimately produce and express the society we live in. These structures and institutions help cultivate the way people live, think, act, socialize, and whether individuals develop wealth or live in poverty. The success of an institution is measured by the level of participation of the individual actors. The more self-interest one has in the institution's outcome, the more energetically they participate. They are more likely to put in much more time, effort, and passion into the institutions if they stand to gain something from it. 
The modern business institution is defined by a continued acquisition of ever more money and power. We might at some point have asked ourselves what we would do in exchange for $10 million. The answers vary, of course. While I do not consider myself a materialistic person, I have to admit that I'd probably commit some terrible crimes for this ultimate prize. The good thing is, I never asked this question. However, this is exactly what they are talking about when the leaders of business face tough decisions. They answer this question daily. They answer it with working conditions, by exploiting environmental disasters, by the influence of government and media, outsourcing, and sometimes even promoting war and death. Our largest institution actually increases criminal pursuits and maximizes immoral behavior. Not only does centralizing power foster immoral behavior, but it also creates inefficiencies and has been shown to be highly unproductive and bureaucratic. The use of central planning by the Soviets demonstrates what happens when power is concentrated into the hands of an elite. The corporation and modern day business have a lot in common with Stalinism. Corporations use a centralized form of planning, even calling the upper tier a government. The top management takes decisions based on highly aggregated data, the quality of which is hard to know. The management then suffers from an information and knowledge deficiencies while the workers below lack the sufficient autonomy to act to correct the inefficiencies, as well as the incentive to communicate accurate information and act to improve the production process. Therefore, inefficiencies become magnified because the few cannot know the needs and wants of an entire population. One way to resolve these deficiencies is by rearranging our institutions to allow for worker self-management. Under this system, all the workers are the owners and the operators of the workplace. Every employee has equity in the workplace and an incentive to see their own enterprise do well. Under workers' control, employees have a say over their own environment and hence their own lives. Because every worker is an owner, major decisions are made by democratic action. One worker, one vote. Power does not flow from the top down. Instead, power is equally shared among all the employees. To have a democratic workplace is not to say that every minor decision is made by the group. Most workers would carry out their regular jobs, but when everyone is affected by a problem, they all work together to negotiate a solution amongst themselves. Because every employee is a manager and an owner, they need to use their own ingenuity, intelligence, and creativity to run their own enterprise. The mechanisms of self-management facilitates the natural unfolding of these positive human attributes. At the same time, a feedback loop is created that maximizes these results. Over time, workers predictably become more intelligent and become more willing to use all of their human faculties in the process of self-management and production. People who are invested in the success of the enterprise will balance their need to have a decent work atmosphere with the effect on overall production. Obviously, nobody wants to carry out the same monotonous task, so jobs like these would be distributed or automated. The workers would share a variety of jobs from manual to more intelligent labor. This doesn't mean that specialization would be eliminated. Specialists would coexist and make decisions affecting their areas of expertise amongst themselves, unless the decision affects the rest of the group. The supervisors of today would be eliminated. If a group of workers feel they need somebody to administer their jobs, they would choose amongst themselves. Moreover, if a manager is not performing his or her duties or treating the employees harshly, that person can be pulled by democratic action. Another side effect of self-management is that competition between employees is replaced by cooperation and solidarity. Adversarial relationships are eliminated when everyone has an equal stake in whether they succeed or fail. All this creates a sense of brother and sisterhood which is reinforced because it is in the individual self-interest to assist each other. This is actually positive for production and productivity. For instance, when cooperation and competition are measured in comparison, study after study and even studies that review other studies show that cooperation is more efficient, productive, and effective. Competition restricts the flow of information between individuals. It redirects energy and impedes progress. When ideas and power are centralized in any body, they become highly bureaucratic and ineffective. Every worker-run enterprise will run according to whatever approach works best. This allows for dynamic creative experimentation and flexibility to meet the complexities of the economy. Without CEOs, CFOs, VPs of this and that, and boards of directors, the waste and massive salaries they receive would pull back to the employees and eliminate the massive incentive for opportunistic immorality. That all sounds great, but the next question is, does worker self-management work? Both history and current research prove that yes, they do. 
For instance, during the Spanish Civil War, many factories in Spain came under workers' control. In Aragon, productivity jumped 20%, while the standard of living was raised by 50 to 100% within a few months. Almost every industry, including health, agriculture, energy, textiles, transportation, water, and most service industries saw large jumps in productivity. Literally millions of workers were participating and self-managing their own affairs in this industrial society before it was crushed out by the communist and fascist armies. One of the largest worker-run companies today is Madrigón in Spain. This federation of worker-run firms consists of 256 companies with almost 93,000 employees. Since 1956, Madrigón has continued to grow and is today's seventh largest company in Spain. Even today, cooperatives play a large part in the world economy. They provide over 100 million jobs around the globe. In some countries such as Finland, cooperatives contribute to over 16% of the GDP. This model is more productive and efficient because it demands that every person work in their own self-interest instead of benefiting the few. Employees today do as little work as possible while creating the illusion that they are working hard. This is natural because there is little incentive for most employees to realize their full potential. The institutionalization of business corrupts and mangles everything it touches, including ourselves. Power and self-interest cannot and should not be centralized. Today, contributing to society by meeting your basic economic needs can mean cooperating in a world of maximized greed and immorality. There is no reason to try to reform the system. Today, the modern business and corporation suffers from the same psychosis and inefficiencies as Stalinism. Most industrialized countries have been smart not to follow the Soviet course directly. However, they've handed centralized power to the hands of modern-day business. The incentive to act immorally is too great for any small collection of people to have. That is why power must be completely decentralized and return to the rightful owner, the individual. We have a workable alternative. Employees should be the managers of their own work, their own surroundings, and their own lives. Self-management is possible in the first step to deconstructing the absolutely dysfunctional nature of our society. Worker self-management maximizes cooperation, critical thinking, creativity. It demands people to take control of their lives and their surroundings. It does this not by assuming people are selfless beings, but assumes people will follow their own self-interest and thereby produce and maximize these positive results. The whole system of worker self-management therefore helps to produce a society of decent, intelligent, and responsible people. Economic systems are the ultimate engines that run society. These systems should express the most basic values of society such as well-being, mutual aid, individual autonomy, cooperation, free association, and voluntary action. These economic systems should also help cultivate positive human attributes such as goodwill, creativity, critical thought, honesty, tolerance, altruism, equality, and self-reliance. In many ways, these qualities follow the golden rule. Treat others the way you would like to be treated. While some left libertarians believe in free markets, most do not. For this reason, a left libertarian society would have a diversity of economic systems. People should have a choice because economic systems, more than anything else, directly affect their everyday lives. Any type of economic supremacy will produce a society where everyone drives the same cars, lives in the same homes, and receives the same education. In other words, think the same, act the same, and live the same lives. Human beings are diverse, so any kind of economic system should allow differences to flourish. Left libertarians, by their very nature, are against the kind of economic fundamentalism that is so prevalent in our political system today. For non-market libertarians, life is more than the car you drive, the home you live in. It's the pursuit of experiences worth tallying into a life. Non-market libertarianism is just a preference, one that I hold. Understanding a non-market system can take a lot of time. For most, the world can only be composed of state capitalism, state socialism, or a mix of the two. In speaking about a non-market system, I consider state socialism to be out of the question. The system of the Soviets and Maoism have proven to be disastrous for human beings because of the use of central planning and concentration of power. Under a non-market libertarian society, communities themselves are free associations based on voluntary action and living under libertarian principles. Decision making and power become completely decentralized and are placed in the hands of every individual. There is no central body and each economic apparatus is spread out and self-managed without the use of any coercion. As with worker self-management, decisions are made by participatory democracy. These communities can be as small as 100 people or as large as 500,000. 
Ideally, communities would be the size of a small town, allowing everyone to be heard and have a say over their own life. Because these are free associated communities, the people who decide to live in them also choose to come together to work towards some practical and achievable end. Like most free associations, individual freedom should be harnessed within it, but must also be extended to include collective freedom. In many ways, these communities work along the same lines as worker self-management. Through economic and community self-management, profits as the sole driving force are removed. This is not to say that economic self-management does not recognize things like supply and demand, scarcity, efficient use of resources, and all the other things essential for an economy to thrive. In many ways, I think non-market libertarians have better ways for resolving these issues. The purpose of this video is to lay down the basic framework. I should also say that the following should not be seen as a blueprint for a future society. Many criticize any attempt to describe non-market possibilities. This particular attempt in describing these systems should be viewed with extreme skepticism or even impossibilities. Predictions of the future are usually wrong. With that said, the following are just possibilities that may or may not be achievable. However, a representation of these systems helps one to visualize and conceptualize the ideas of a non-market libertarian community and its potentials. The idea of abolishing work for most left libertarians is central because they see work as something that stifles human growth. By work, I mean mandatory rote and unpleasant work. Obviously, things such as painting a picture, scientific inquiry, gardening for pleasure do not fit this category. The abolishment of work should be seen as a goal, something to strive for rather than a predicted reality. Under a self-managed community, large steps could be taken in this direction. For instance, the entire industry of advertising and public manipulation industries would be eliminated because they would no longer serve a purpose. There would no longer be massive allocation of business resources poured into creating artificial ones by manipulating people's emotions. There would be no advertisements to litter our public spaces and no manipulation of the media with corporate think tanks and front groups. Business would be self-managed, so wasted misallocations towards boards of directors and management would be returned to the workers. The fact that these communities would be self-managed and politicians and government would be eliminated means that bribing politicians with campaign donations would no longer exist along with its wasteful and bureaucratic spending. There would be no need to use government officials to expand markets by pushing them into other countries where they are not wanted. Patents and copyrights would be gone with information freely shared which means the billions spent on things like creating copycat drugs and technology would be a practice of the past. For these reasons and much more, it is believed that the work week could be cut extensively. Under free association, communities can pull their resources to figure out how to use technology to eliminate unwanted work. This can be done within the worker-owned company, but communities can also use their best minds to work towards these ends. Instead of engineers trying to figure out how to make a better blender or toaster, they can be utilized, if the engineer chooses, to design more efficient means and technology towards ending unnecessary work. Technological prototypes would probably take the form of more universalized technology that could be applied to most jobs, while work on more obscure uses would wait until later. The power behind a self-managed economy and community is that a society can take any form it desires. A community might come together and decide that 16 hours of work per week is more than sufficient for people to maintain their living standards. Perhaps this community decides a required work week to be 32 hours to help increase the standard of living. The first 16 hours would be devoted to the general maintenance of the city, so you would probably work in a profession that you are trained in such as nursing, carpentry, etc. These jobs would be under worker self-management. The second 16 hours would be devoted to an association of your choice. These associations should provide some kind of service to the community. The main purpose of these associations are to pursue the things that you love. These voluntary groups might take the form of music, cooking, gardening, teaching, physics, painting, architecture, engineering, sports, and so on. It doesn't matter as long as they are somehow productive. In a society like this, gardeners would beautify public spaces, musicians would play live shows for the public, painters and artists would decorate the town, physicists would make new discoveries for all. An engineer might work her first 16 hours running hydraulic systems for basic maintenance of the town, while her second 16 hours is devoted to making her own discoveries. This information would be freely shared for all. It is believed that under a system like this, massive discoveries would flourish without the short-term money-driven costs of research and development. Even the look of a city under economic self-management can take interesting directions. A community might want to pursue something like the older parts of Western Europe, where great cathedrals or civic places are centered in the middle of town, 
where everything from homes, restaurants, and shopping are walking distance. A place where architecture actually expresses its history, people, and culture. Or perhaps a community would want something more futuristic like the ideas proposed by Jock Fresco, where an entire city is automated and people live in alien looking homes, a place where science and community are central, and people look forward to a world of post-scarcity. Many left libertarians have suggested something like eco-friendly communities that would be artistically tailored to their natural surroundings. Their square or civic areas would be interlaced by streams, their places of assembly surrounded by groves, their physical contours respected and tastefully landscaped, their soil nurtured caringly to foster plant variety for themselves. The town would be decentralized and scaled to human dimensions using recycling as well as integrating solar, wind, hydraulic, and methane producing installations into highly spotted patterns for producing power. Agriculture, aquaculture, stock raising would be regarded as crafts. Perhaps none of these things sounds interesting to you. The whole idea is that you will be allowed to help decide rather than corporate and political interests that dominate our lives. Economic self-management should help facilitate people to consider their own ideas and use their own creativity to design the places they'd want to inhabit. These possibilities would also create higher participation since individuals might actually have an influence on the outcome. While each community is autonomous, they would not exist alone. Nearly all communities would be connected by a web and integrated into a federation. Federations have absolutely zero power. They only exist as a statistical and coordinating body. The federation would be a makeup of delegates from each community. The federation is also a free association where communities can disassociate any time. All interactions are designed so that self-interest facilitates mutual aid and cooperation of each community. Left libertarianism works like any other political and economic system. The only difference is that it is structured differently. These structures are designed solely for the purpose to maximize what is good in humanity, such as liberty and cooperation, while limiting what might be considered bad, such as greed and self-indulgence. This is why non-market libertarians prefer this system. We cannot exactly spend our way into these types of societies through market forces. In almost every culture throughout time, the golden rule has been a central ethical principle. Almost every religion and every school of philosophy have endorsed it. Today, the very idea of living by this idea, whether it is in the workplace or our daily lives, has become an impossibility. Any economic or political system should help generate the basic ideals of this simple rule to produce a society based on fraternity rather than hostility. We need to stop living by the fallacy that just because something is economically good means that it must be good. Economic systems should be built for human beings and not the other way around. True progress can only be achieved when human beings are liberated and exist in an environment that facilitates the liberty of personal self-management, worker self-management, and economic self-management. We have seen what happens when only a few make our decisions and build a world around their game. They have stifled the very essence of what it means to be human. It is finally time to liberate and unleash the beauty that lies hidden within each of us and help cultivate a better tomorrow.